Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much for the warm welcome, uh, first of all. And uh, I'm very happy to be here today in the uh, Buddhist Mahavihara. Uh, that's my first experience uh, to share some Dhamma with you all. And uh, I know and I have heard uh, very good things about this uh, temple and the devotees here uh, who always come and uh, practice the Dhamma, to listen to the Dhamma. Uh, so therefore, I consider this is uh, to be a very uh, important privilege to me as well uh, to share some Dhamma with you all. <coughs> so today, uh, I'm going to bring your attention uh, to a special discourse Sutta uh, teaching. Uh, the name of this sutta is called uh, the Sakunagi Sutta. Sakunagi Sutta. The, the word Sakuna in Pali means the bird. Okay. So uh, this entire sutta uh, is centered around uh, a story, a very simple story of a little bird. Uh, even though this particular sutta is very short uh, in length, but the Dhamma it teaches us, uh, the deep message uh, it conveys to us uh, is very deep, very practical, very broad, uh, in a way that really covers the entire teachings of the Buddha. So this sutta simply focuses on a very simple fact, a uh, very practical aspect of our life, which is to find our true happiness, our real happiness in our daily life. So when we uh, think about that important, very essential uh, fact that we all are looking for in our everyday life, we definitely uh, need to understand what comes in conflict, what is preventing us from having experience in reaching uh, this important goal of our daily happiness. Uh, so this sutta uh, simply uh, teaches us uh, how to understand this true meaning of our life and to understand uh, and control what comes in conflict with our happiness. So, therefore, I think uh, the sutta is very relevant to all of us. So, without taking uh, much time, we can jump right into the sutta to save time. Uh, <clears throat> so, the Lord Buddha, uh, one day addressing the venerable monks, uh, told this story, very interesting, very simple story about this small bird. Uh, so one day, uh, a big hawk, a uh, big eagle-like bird, swooped down on a quail, a very small, tiny little bird, and seized it. Okay. And uh, as this small little bird quail taken by this big hawk, this small bird was, was crying out loud, screaming, oh what a bad luck, I got caught up by this big hawk, this is my bad luck today, but this wouldn't have happened to me if I knew how to live within my own proper territory. If I knew how to live within my ancestral territory, field, I wouldn't have been through this. This big hawk wouldn't have seized me. And then hearing this, uh, the hawk 
just released this little bird saying that no matter little bird you go to your own territory you, you go you to your own ancestral area field no matter where you are I will come and get you hmm? I will come and get you so then this small little bird quail happily went into his own territory the field so as the hawk, uh, as this little bird, where is your own ancestral territory field, the, the quail explained, the newly plowed field with clumps of earth all turned up. This is my own territory. This is where I exactly live. If I live there, if I am there, you cannot come and get me. And then this, this little bird went there to his own field, territory, and it stood up right on top of a clump of earth and shouted at this big hawk, big bird, hey, you hawk, come and get me now if you dare. And then this big hawk, <coughs> without thinking twice, with the confidence of its huge energy, power, he just swooped down to this little bird to catch it, holding hmm? its two wings, just like an arrow, just shoot at this small bird. And then what happened? This small bird knew what to do. So he was very comfortable within his own place, within its own territory, the field. So he knew what to do. As this big hawk was approaching this little bird, he just slipped in, in, inside the clump of earth. And then what happened? This big hawk hit his chest right on the clump of earth and died right there. Okay. So this is a small story. It's a very simple story. Okay. I know little kids would love this story. <laughs> but can you imagine a fully enlightened one is telling this story to a group of monks. The Buddha is teaching us a big lesson with this simple story. So, taking this story as an example, as an analogy, the Buddha teaches the monks with a very important Dhamma message, very interesting practical Dhamma. So, Buddha says, Dear monks, know your own territory, know your own ancestral field, Know your own domain and do not astray into others' domain and do not get caught up by the mark. Okay, so this is the Buddha's advice. Taking this simple story, Buddha teaches just like this a small bird without staying within its own territory, going away from its own territory, this small bird got caught up by this uh, deadly hawk, this big bird. But if it were in the uh, own territory, own field, this little bird wouldn't have been through that disaster. Okay. So Buddha teachers are just like that. We have our own field. We have our own domain. We have our own territory. When we are practicing the Dhamma, when we are looking for enlightenment, when we practice the Dhamma, we need to know our own territory. 
We need to know our own domain to be safe. And at the same time, we need to understand what is to be in someone else's domain or area, the field. So what the teachers here, it's always painful, sorrowful to live in others' territories. So in the teachings of the Buddha, especially in this particular Sakunagi Sutta, it clearly explains to us what is the domain of the Mara. It is clearly explaining to us this very special concept of the Mara. Have you heard of the concept Mara? The Mara. Simply, uh, it is the evil god, actually. You know, if you know the life of the Buddha, uh, this evil god is very powerful, very powerful, with his divine powers. Uh, he can control many things. Okay, so when you learn the life of the Buddha, Mara came to distract him many occasions. At many occasions, this Mara came and uh, disturbed him. He tried to distract him. Even before he got enlightened, uh, we know when he uh, renounced his palace in order to uh, look for the truth. Uh, and even at the enlightened moment, uh, it is said that Mara came and tried to distract him. And even after the enlightenment, at many occasions, the Mara came and invited the Buddha to pass away. So you have uh, acquired your God. You have done whatever you wanted to do in this world, so please pass away. So the Mara was not happy about the Buddha because the Buddha was leading everybody in the right direction, proper direction, spiritual path. But the Mara is always delighted in the worldly pleasures, in the worldly matters. So he is always against the spiritual. So that's why he was against the Buddha always. So, but in this particular sutra, it teaches us uh, a very important aspect of the Mara. So, when we learn about the Mara, as it uh, explains in the Dhamma in many suttas, the Mara can be identified as the negativities. Okay, the negativities that we go through in our everyday life. And simply, whatever comes in conflict can be considered as the Mara. Okay, whenever you try to achieve something, whenever you try to gain something in your life, when you try so hard, if anything, anybody comes to distract you, prevent you from reaching that goal, can be identified as the Mara. So this is the simple idea. So what is mostly important here as our own individual practice, this internal Maras, what we identify as the Kilesa, or mental impurities, defilements, hindrances. Huh? So these are the most powerful Maras that we all have within ourselves. Okay. So, as I mentioned earlier, right in the beginning, when we try to find our inner peace and happiness, our tranquility in our daily life, there are many things to distract us. We all are living in a very distractive world, society. There are many conditions to distract us. So we can see that Negativities are always there to take us, to catch us, to distract us. So whenever we try to find our real inner peace and happiness, we need to learn about 
how we get caught up by these marks, these inner disturbances. So Buddha clearly teaches us what is the field, what is the domain of the mark. What is the domain of the Mara? Technically, in the Dhamma terms, it clearly explains that five sensual fields, five sensual experiences, the forms cognizable by the eyes, sounds cognizable by the ears, the smell, aromas, Cognizable by the nose, the flavors, cognizable by the tongue, the tactile sensations, cognizable by the body. These five sensual experiences are the field of the mark. This is what Buddha clearly explains to us. So, if anyone indulges in these territories, if anyone gets delighted in these sensual fields, sensual experiences, we call them the karma. Hmm? The karma means the agreeable, desirable qualities of these sensual experiences. All these sensual experiences are having these common characteristics, common nature of having more desire when we experience these sensual experiences, we always get caught up by them. They, in a way, control us. We, we want to go after them again and again. And they are very agreeable. They are very pleasing to us. They are very pleasing to us. And they are enticing. We automatically get attached to them. They are having a glue-like quality. That's why we get attached to them. So this is the common characteristic of all these sensual pleasures. So whenever we get attached to them, whenever we begin to enjoy these sensual pleasures, we feel that oh, this is the whole purpose of our life. So we can see that how people are obsessed by these sensual pleasures, sensual experiences. They are always after that. So they think that this is the whole purpose of my life, to enjoy. So it clearly explains in the Dhamma how we are uh, caught up by these sensual pleasures. So we are in an endless effort when we think about these sensual pleasures that we are going after always, every single moment. This is the purpose of a normal uh, life. That is to please our eyes, please our ears. And so on, all these senses, that is the purpose of our everyday life, basically. How to be happy means how to please these senses. So can you think about it, right from the beginning, right from birth to death, what people are trying, simply to please these senses. That's why they do everything in their life, having that same purpose. But we can see that your eyes never say, they never say that, hey, I have seen enough. <laughs> There's no such a thing. There's no such a thing. They, they are never satisfied. It is the same with your ears. All the senses, they never say enough. You can never satisfy them. There's no end. So you, we can see that we are in an ongoing process of pleasing these senses. But we can see at the same time 
what people are going through as an eventual result, as an eventual consequence, what people are end up with, the frustration, disappointment, tension, anxieties, insecurities, and all these negativities are after the sensual pleasures, the desire for the sensual pleasures. So we can see that happens in our everyday life as a common reality. So that's why Buddha says, if anyone is indulging, finding the happiness within the sensual pleasures, that person is vulnerable to all negativities. Okay? If anyone is caught up by the sensual pleasures, the mara can see you very easily. The mara sees you very easily, very quickly. Mara finds the space. Mara gets the chance to distract you, disturb you. So therefore Buddha says, the sensual pleasure, the desire for the sensual pleasure is not your own domain. It is the domain of the Mara. It is the domain of all negativities. It is the domain of all uh, glaciers, mental impurities and emotions that really distract us. So in many sutras, the Buddha clearly explains why the sensual pleasures are not okay. What's wrong with them? What is the problem with that? But this is very contradictory to the ordinary human experience, right? As I explained earlier, that is the main purpose of human life, to have these sensual pleasures. But Buddha clearly explains what's wrong with these sensual pleasures if we go after them. There are so many negativities, many problems, unhappiness and everything is after these sensual pleasures. So we can see that for many problems in our life, many problems in our daily life can be traced back to these roots. All of these problems are having the roots of the desire for any of these pleasures. You can simply understand that. this is the root level, root cause, the desire for the sensual pleasure for all human problems. So therefore, we are not free from that negativity. We are not free from that pain and suffering if we are always indulging in the sensual pleasures. That is why Buddha says, this is not your own domain. The five sensual pleasures are the domain of the mara, the domain of all negativities. And then, Buddha explains, what is your own domain then? So how can you be well protected? Hmm? If you are vulnerable to all these negativities, when you are in this outside domain, what is your own domain? which is well protected within your control. So what is your own domain? Buddha explains. It is nothing but the four foundations of mindfulness. Four foundations of mindfulness. This is our own territory. This is our own domain. So we know namely what these four foundations of mindfulness are. The mindfulness on our the body, the physical reality, for all our experiences. There's a physical reality. Hmm? How we feel, how we experience, or what happens to our body. If it gets tense, or if we feel so light or relaxed, peaceful. All this there is a physical reality for all our experiences. 
And then, for all our experiences, there is a sensual reality. Vedana Anupasana. Hmm? For all our experiences, there is a sensual experience. Even though we have no, even though we are aware or not, it is taking place all the time. Every single moment, there is a sensual reality for all our experiences. Hmm? And the sensual reality is very powerful. When you look at it, how we get attached to something or averse to something, it is eventually this sensual field. Huh? It is this sensual experience that we like or dislike. Therefore you say, I like it, I love it, or I hate it. But you don't see that sensual field in yourself, in your body. That much we are obsessed with this external reality, objective reality we call, what is outside there. But we don't see what is happening to us in the sensual experience. But eventually it is the sensual experience that takes place all the time, you know, involving with our whole system. So nothing can be neglected there. Our physical body and our brain, our nerve system, the hormones and everything is involved there to create this sensual field within our body. So we can see that. Simply when you get angry, it is all over yourself, right? Without missing any single point in yourself. You have become the total anger, nothing but the anger. So you experience it sensually all over yourself. So when you have a desire, that sensual field also is all over yourself. So if the sensual pleasure is pleasant, so soothing, makes you feel better, you get attached to it, you like it, you want it more, you go after it, right? But you don't say that, you don't see that sensual pleasure is the thing that you really get attached to. Without knowing that, you say, Oh, I love this cheesecake, I love this apple, I love this person. But it is not this external object that you really like or love. The sensual experience that creates in yourself, in the presence of that external object, is the thing that you really get attached to. This is a wonderful reality to observe. The eventual happening the reality, right? So that way we can see for all our experience there's a sensual reality. Buddha says we have to be mindful about. And then of course with this sensual reality also there is another reality that we always share that we always have which is the mental reality. The mental reality how we feel it in our mind. What is happening to my mind when I enjoy something or when I hate something? Hmm? There's a mental experience always. So that is also the same. If it is pleasing to my, my mind, if it is pleasing to my mental experience or it is a disturbance to my mental experience, our reaction is different. So there's always a mental reality for all experience. And then the fourth, the conditional reality we call. How things happen as a reality or the result of this causality we call, the causes and effects. <coughs> things happen according to the causes and effects. So that conditional reality is always there. Okay. So Buddha says, this is your own domain. This is your own territory that you need to stay within. So when you are within your own domain, when you are within your own territory, Mara will not see you. 
Mara cannot see you because it is not his field. The Mara can see you only when you are in the sensual domain, sensual experience, sensual field. Because that is the Mara's tune. <laughs> right? Mara does not know the spirituality. The Mara does not know the Dhamma. It is not his territory, his field. So that's why Buddha says, know your own domain. Stay within your own territory. And then you will be well protected. You will be well protected. The Mara will not see you. Or in another way, the negativities, the defilements, hindrances cannot distract you, disturb you, and bring you unhappiness or suffering. Okay. So when we know that, we always hear this, right? We always learn about the Four Noble Truths, and the Noble Eightfold Path, and especially the Four Foundations of Mindfulness. So how it can really protect us? How it can protect us? How it can provide us this security? Especially when we are talking about this internal, our inner disturbances, the negativities in our everyday life, in our everyday life. How can we be well protected when we focus on these four foundations of mindfulness? Hmm? So Buddha says, Buddha teaches us how to reflect on these four foundations of mindfulness, right? Especially having the right goal, the right purpose of this spiritual journey. Whenever we want to let go of these practical everyday life negativities, hmm? tension, anxieties, depression, insecurity and all these negativities, we always want to get rid of them. So when we have this intention, Buddha teaches us the importance about the introspection, the inward attention, the sensual pleasures are always has something to do with the external world. You always need something to be happy. This is one of the drawbacks, the weaknesses of the sensual pleasures. You always need to have something externally to feel better, to make you happy, to fill your gap or the empty space. Without that, you are nothing. Without that, you feel empty. Without that, you feel very unhappy. Mm? So that is the nature of the five sensual pleasures. When we are always concerned about this external world, external conditions. Mm? But here, in the four foundations of mindfulness, we can clearly see that Buddha completely turns our attention to our inward experience, our inner experience. Or, in another way, to pay our attention to our subjective reality. Whenever we experience something, to look at yourself, look at myself, my body and mind, what happens to me? What is taking place here in my body and mind? which is very difficult in the beginning because we are always concerned about the external world. Our whole concern is turned to the outside world. So the spiritual journey, all our spiritual journey begins right from the moment when we pay our attention to our inner experience, our inner world our inner experience. This is the beginning of the spiritual journey. And only that way we can understand, we can clearly 
observe what exactly happens to me, my body and mind, in terms of these four foundations of mindfulness in its own reality. So this is the clear understanding or the point of having the practice of four foundations of mindfulness. And clearing our goal, the purpose of simply overcoming our negativities. We observe these four conditions, the physical reality, sensual reality, the mental reality and the conditional reality. And we, when we mindfully observe these conditions, again and again, again and again, with the right perspective, with the right understanding, according to the Buddhist teachings, in its own reality, what we eventually see as the Satipatthana Sutta, the four foundations of mindfulness, this discourse explains, we can simply see these conditions are just taking place the physical, sensual, mental, and conditional. These conditions are just taking place when we train your mindful awareness. When you train your mindful awareness upon these four foundations, four conditions, one comes to clearly comprehend that these Conditions are just existing without being able to get hold on to any of these conditions permanently. As everything is subject to constantly change without our control. When everything is subject to change, you may not find any reality that you can identify as me, mine, myself. This is how we let go of this ignorance, misunderstanding of the self, which is a very important essential, essential teachings of the Buddha, as the beginning point of all suffering. The beginning of all suffering is to have this identification of identification with these conditions. To consider this body as me, my, myself to consider the sensual experiences also as me, mine, myself. And even to identify and personalize my mental experiences, what is in my mind, my emotions, this is how we call, this is how we feel. And all these conditions eventually we identify as me, mine, myself. And this is what simply can be overcome by practicing the mindfulness. When we clearly observe these conditions on their own reality, with the, the light of mindfulness, mindful observation, that ignorance, that illusion is automatically goes away. And then you find that you cannot find any permanent happiness or pleasure in these sensual experiences, in any of these conditions, physical, sensual, mental or conditional realities. So you begin to realize how things are happening according to the causes and effects. Things happen when the necessary conditions are present. When these conditions are gone, that vanishes. So this is the causality. And then you are no longer depending on these external conditions. Anisito As a result of seeing that truth, as a result of seeing that reality, both internal and external, subjective and objective reality, your happiness is no longer depending on external conditions. This is how the Mara is not going to see you. The Mara is not going to see you because you are 
your happiness is not depending on the Mara's territory. Is that clear? It's very clear teachings. Hmm? Within this understanding, within this realization, the happiness you are looking for is no longer depend on these external conditions. Or technically, within these sensual fields, sensual reality, sensual pleasures, seeing the truth, seeing the reality of anicca, dukkha, ananta, hmm? how all these conditions are subject to change without our control. Hmm? And seeing the reality of when you get attached to any of these ever-changing conditions, reality, that ends up in suffering, the pain, and all other negativities. And the deeper you go into that realization, the clearer your understanding becomes, where you find the non-self reality. That you cannot identify any of these permanent existence within your body or mind as a permanent single entity. So you are destroying not only the desire for the sensual pleasures of the mind, you are even destroying your own identity. So when there's no one in yourself, there's no one that Mara can see. So this is how we simply overcome these negativities, these disturbances. So this is what Buddha teaches us. So know your own domain. Stay within your own domain, your own territory, and you will be well protected. So you do not stay or you do not astray into the Mara's domain, which is the five sensual pleasures, five sensual experiences. So this is a very practical, direct teachings of the Buddha. It gives us the ultimate purpose of the Dhamma practice, how everything is related to that practice itself. So there are some important facts that we can talk about this point. You know, first of all, when we think about the use of mindfulness, what type of mindfulness we need to maintain. We are supposed to be maintaining in our daily life, uh, especially when we meditate at least, you know, unchanging, constant mindful attention to our inner experience, to be well protected. Why? If you miss any single moment, the Mara can see you. <laughs> the Mara can get you. That's why Buddha says, the importance of constant mindful attention to your own mind, upon your own mind. This is how we are supposed to protect our mind. Buddha gives us a very clear, very practical example how we should protect our mind. Suppose you are given with a big bowl filled with water or oil right to the top of this bowl. And ask you to carry this bowl without dropping any single drop. Can you do that? You are given with a big bowl <coughs> filled with water or oil right to the top edge of this bowl. Mm -hmm. And you are asked to carry this bowl as you walk gently. Can you imagine what type of mindfulness, what type of careful attention you should be maintaining? in order to do that successfully, right? If you miss any single moment, you can drop the water or the oil. 
So you cannot look anywhere else. You need to be very careful. You need to be very attentive. You need to be very present. Every single moment in order to do that. So the Buddha says, whenever you protect your mind, that type of mindfulness, that type of inward attention is required to protect your mind. Why? This mind is always vulnerable to these mental diseases, mental problems, negativities, kilesa, we call it, defilements. So if you miss any single moment, you can get caught up by these disturbances. And if you know the Inri Bhavana Sutta, which is a very uh, interesting discourse given by the Buddha. The Indri Bhavana Sutta, how to train our senses. You know, I'm bringing this up as it is related to this topic. It is, always, it is also talks about how we should maintain our mindful awareness to our sensual experience. So Buddha teaches us there. To look at our sensual experience, to pleasant, unpleasant or neutral sensations as they are created within our system, just to identify these sensual experiences are as compound reality, conditioned reality. The sensual pleasures are compounded, constructed. We call them the sankhara. Depending on many conditions, it is created. And when these conditions are gone, it becomes a temporary reality, experience. So therefore, whenever you see that reality, you do not become intoxicated by that sensual pleasure, knowing that reality. It is not permanent. It is conditional reality. It is no longer there when it is gone. And in order to do that type of observation in this particular sutta of Indriya Bhavana, Buddha clearly explains us how we are supposed to maintain this mindful attention to our inward, uh, our inner experience, giving us some uh, practical examples, just like the speed how we snap our two fingers, how quickly we do that, right? How quickly we can do that, snapping our two fingers, how quickly we do that. And that much speed, that quickly we should be able to maintain our mindful attention to our inner experience. How rapidly, how quickly we are supposed to pay our attention to, our, to what happens to our body and mind and to observe what we are going through. That type of awareness we need. And going further, he explains, just like the water drops getting onto the lotus leaf, right? When water gets into, onto a water, uh, lotus leaf, what happens? It never stays. It quickly slips away. Hmm? Never staying. That quickly, one should be able to pay one's attention to the sensual experience. To observe how these negativities are created through this process. See how much attention, how much sharp, accurate attention we are supposed to maintain within our sensual experience. How hard it is. It is not a simple practice. You know, when we talk about that point, it clearly explains how 
complex, how hard, how challenging even this practice, you know. Because our mind is that much vulnerable to these negativities, these problems, uh, these inner problems. Therefore, we should train our mind to maintain such an awareness to our inner experience. Uh, and then, only then we can protect our mind. Only then we can stay undistracted, undisturbed by these hindrances, negativities in our everyday life. And then, but this explanation according to this sutra, we can see Buddha never says that you are not supposed to be enjoying. This is very interesting. This is very important point to think about too, you know. According to his explanations, in some discourses, Buddha clearly explains how one can simply enjoy the world, the life, still within one's own territory. If you are within your own domain, you can still enjoy without getting caught up by the mind. This is how you can trick even the mind. <laughs> so Buddha and the other enlightened beings are the most smarter ones who were able to trick the mind. Hmm? So it is just like, just next to this Sakunaki Sutta, Buddha teaches us the Makkata Sutta. The Makkata, the Pali Makkata, the word Makkata means the monkey. So Buddha teaches us this point very clearly. He says that uh, there are places in the Mount Himalaya or Everest that both monkeys and human beings can never reach. There are places like that, very dangerous, inaccessible places. But there are places only monks can survive, monks can hang around. But there are places in the Mount Everest that both monkeys and human beings can live and reach. So Buddha says, there are some monkeys, there are some monkeys in the Mount Everest. They go out of their own domain, hmm? out of their own domain, live in their own territories and easily get caught up by the people who set the traps to catch these monkeys. So if monkeys are careless, if monkeys have no skill to live within others' domains, easily get caught up by these people, hunters, and go through a lot of pain and eventually get killed. But Buddha says, there are some monkeys, they are very clever, they are very smart, <laughs> huh? What they do, knowing their own territory, when they are within their own territory, they even go to the traps and they eat the treat without getting caught up. And they just run away. And they just escape. Hmm? So this is what happens when you are smart. When you have the proper mindfulness, when you have this inward attention, constant awareness, you know how to enjoy it without getting caught up by the mind, by any of these negative conditions, places, mental impurities, emotions. Uh, this is what we need to learn. Uh, 
So otherwise it is not saying that you are not supposed to enjoy anything in this life. Buddha never said that. Hmm? Because they are the ones who went after the ultimate happiness. How can they say and don't enjoy anything? <laughs> right? It is not fair. It's not right. Right? It's a very big misunderstanding when people get to know about Buddhism in the beginning. It sounds more pessimistic. There's no room to enjoy anything. It looks very dark, you know. It has no any excitement. It has no any pleasure. <laughs> it has no any joy, any thrilling experience. Huh? So they easily get fed up whenever they get to know about Buddha's teachings. But if they take enough time and observe and learn the right Dhamma, when they go a little bit further into the teachings, we can see that how the Buddha and other enlightened beings enjoyed the ultimate happiness in this world, right within this life, right within this world, where we exactly are. They didn't go to the heaven, the moon, or anywhere else, right? They just live just like us, right within this society, just like us, having no difference at all. Every condition is the same. Hmm? So they could escape the Mara. They didn't get caught up by the Mara, but they enjoyed the life. They enjoyed the nature because they were perfectly mindful. They were perfectly aware of their experience, their inner experience. What happens to their body and mind when they go through these things? So they were very well protected. Mm. So this is a very important thing we need to remind, remember. Mm. So this is something actually missing even in our Buddhist community, I see. With a lot of experience even in the United States, in Sri Lanka, as I teach uh, Dhamma with many people, because of this pessimistic sound, in the Dhamma, you know, they don't seem to be enjoying anything in this practice, <laughs> in these teachings, you know. Even when they are meditating, you can see their face looks so tired, so ugly sometimes, you know. They are looking for something which is not possible. <laughs> you can see how desperate they are, you know, how disappointed they are right within this practice, you know. So, it is not something external to us, beyond ourselves. It's right within ourselves. It's right within ourselves, right within this domain. Uh, so, can you interestingly see what is your own domain? It is nothing but this body and mind. Interestingly, Buddha says, this is your domain, this is your territory. Live within it. Practice your mindfulness. Be aware of it. Be clear. Do not get deluded. Do not get intoxicated by the sensual pleasures. And do not get caught up by the mind. Uh, and that understanding itself becomes the unique joy, happiness, pleasure that you can never find equal to anything in this world. This is how the Buddha and other enlightened beings were so happy enjoying this world. Uh, so this message we need to bring into our present moment. Hmm? How to enjoy our practice? How to enjoy our present moment? So for my experience, you know, for my understanding, I don't need a deep father for tomorrow. I don't need Nibbana for my next life. How can we so sure? <laughs> How can you be so sure, right? Our Nibbana, our enlightenment is for this moment. Otherwise, I don't need such an enlightenment. If I cannot enjoy, if I cannot enjoy the freedom of suffering, if I cannot enjoy the freedom of all these mental impurities right within this moment, 
this is a very good question that we need to keep in our mind how to enjoy what you practice even within a single sitting you should bring your nibbana into your practice you should be aware of it you should be conscious about it this is what greatly missing in our practice sometimes people are not aware of the pure states of their mind even so they cannot enjoy they don't identify that uh, they cannot identify it so they don't know how to enjoy so our practice our realization our nibbana can be so practical when we look at it this way my nibbana is for this moment uh, whenever you are mindful about your body and mind according to these four foundations of mindfulness if you are able to see how your mind is not caught up by the mind or any of these negative conditions can you identify that moment as a nibbana piece it is possible it is possible for anyone so this is what we need to identify We did, this is what we need to acknowledge in the practice, uh, so we can see how even in the modern uh, science, even, how they are fascinated about this mindfulness practice, how it is applied into our brain activities, which is very interesting. What they have discovered, what they have understood today, these emotions to be the most disturbing part of our daily experience hmm? whenever we get emotional as a very common inevitable reality of the sensual pleasures right eventually we go through many negative emotions anger hate lust fear worries anxieties all these things are inevitable part of our daily life today all these things are emotions uh, so these emotions are not automatic things this is what we need to identify understand these emotions are not automatic conditions they are some conditional realities which simply explains they have some physical reality they have some sensual reality mental realities like that okay so so the modern science has identified the most responsible part of our brain for our emotions which is the amygdala hmm? if you know the brain anatomy the amygdala that part is mostly responsible for our emotions this is where all emotions are regulated if that part gets damaged that person doesn't have any emotion it is very interesting there are lots of research going on on this point the amygdala which is a very basic part of our uh, evolution the evolutionary brain functions based on this amygdala for our survival purpose just to survive in this world just to avoid the suffering the pain the fear the amygdala creates regulates these emotions uh, to set our entire system to be ready for flight or fight state hmm? so all these emotions are regulated in the we call it the emotional brain which is the amygdala okay so it is in the normal basic evolutionary process okay so the the nature of our emotions whenever our brain gets into any emotional experience what happens to us So today, there's a very interesting uh, field or subject called 
emotional intelligence right have you heard that term yeah. emotional intelligence which is very interesting as i uh, as i study psychology is counseling i got a chance to learn about this topic which is very interesting very practical the emotional intelligence teaches us the importance of understanding how our emotions are created within ourselves especially within our brain uh, you can call it the mind the brain how these emotions are regulated created uh, and even what happens to me when i go through these emotions i have to observe i have to get to know about very well i need to be educated about my own emotions what happens to me what i go through when i have these emotions and also another important part of this emotional intelligence is that i need to be smart understanding others emotions as well if i do not understand your emotion i can get into trouble that relationship is not going to survive very well hmm? we need to be able to feel others emotions as well and even going beyond that we need to be able to how to positively interact with others emotions see how important that teaching that practical aspect to our emotions for our uh how many is life so in that teaching going into the brain activities as it talks about how these emotions are regulated in the amygdala they have come up with this important understanding about the application of mindfulness uh, there are two signal pathways in our brain as we regulate these emotions okay so one basic uh, signal pathway is to for all these sensory experiences to go through the amygdala directly okay the very initial basic pathway is for all these sensory signals to go through the amygdala which is the basic uh, part of the brain in the survival process and as the nature of our emotion emotions can never think do you know that emotions does not have potential to think hmm? emotions are blind we say that right we call our emotions are blind so we call it the emotional hijack which is very interesting term when there there's an emotion in your brain it takes your entire brain off can you imagine what happens to you when you are angry just like what is explained earlier you become nothing but the anger so the emotion of anger takes you off it hijacks your brain so everything that you do out of anger has a negative effect uh, so emotional hijack that's how our amygdala takes our brain over but as a part of our higher evolutionary process what develops in the human brain is the the frontal lobe we call the thinking part of the brain the thinking part of the brain when it develops there's a potential there's a chance for us to guide our signal pathways before it gets into the amygdala okay before our signals the sensory signals gets into the amygdala part which is the emotional brain we can divert our signals to go through the thinking brain thinking part of the brain which is the frontal lobe and that is where we rationalize these signals 
we rationalize these concepts before they get into emotional stages, before they take a soul. Uh, so they have realized the importance of or the application of mindful awareness, how it is relevant, how it is effective to avoid these disturbing brain, this emotional brain, to be free from these emotional disturbances. So this is a very special part of uh, the emotional intelligence. So we can see that directly what Buddha discovered, what Buddha realized, what Buddha teaches us to guide our signals, guide our sensory experiences to go through the thinking path to analyze them rationally without or before you react to them, before they get into the emotional level. See how practical they are, how practical it is to our everyday life. How practical it is. So we can simply apply that. Even in the brain levels, we can see where this mindfulness really applies. Technically, that is where it takes place. And then when it comes to our practical, superficial experience, the manifestation is going to be very different. What we are experiencing overall is going to be very much affected by this understanding. Uh, so, this is what I wanted to share with you, with the Sutta of Sakunaki, how to avoid the mara how to avoid the negativities with the light of mindfulness, staying within our own domain, which is the four foundations of mindfulness. Okay, so I hope uh, that you learned something new or you enhanced your own Dhamma knowledge. And I hope this knowledge, this understanding, this realization will bring you some comfort, some relief, some peace and tranquility into your daily life. Okay, so I wish you all the best. So if you have any questions, we can take a few moments. Yes. Well, you know, most people have a stroke. Uh huh. They are very smart. They do a lot of things. I had a stroke and the report. And the report. They can't remember everything. Uh -huh. How to help this people? How to help such people? Ah, uh, yes. They are smart people, they do a lot of things. Right. But I had a stroke, that can go caught. They can't remember, they can't even use some everything in the is caught. Right, right, right. How they have this problem? Uh well <laughs> Yeah, yes, that's what you do is correct. You talk about this thing, I know. Yeah, yeah. That's my only thing. It can happen also to your body. Mm -hmm. It can True. happen to your body. Right. Gone. Mm -hmm. But how to help this kind of people? They can't remember. They can't walk anywhere. Right. Ah, this yeah, so it's a very interesting question, right? It's a, it's about the brain too. Yes, you know, right. How some people in certain stages, in certain ages, you know, how they lose their memory, you know? So they have uh, clearly understood today, you know, what happens. Just like I explained the responsible place in our brain for the emotions, there's a certain place in our brain which is responsible for our memories, which is called the hippocampus. Uh, that part is responsible for our memories. So for certain conditions, maybe due to radiation or age or any chemicals, because of many conditions, that part of the brain can get deteriorated. As a natural process, it can happen. So memory can go away. So that memory cannot restore, according to uh, the modern uh, statistics or research. It is very difficult to restore that type of memory. So it's very complicated, you know, how uh, this brain functions and how people 
even experiences these things, you know, experience these things when they happen to them, you know. Uh, but we can think about how our mindfulness practice can help us, you know. Uh, even in the modern science, they have discovered with a lot of research the influence of our mindfulness practice as meditation practice. Uh, how to enhance our necessary parts of the brain to function better, you know, to the optimal level even, you know, as a result of our constant mindful, mindfulness practice, you know. So we can have at least some hope, <laughs> right, if we practice enough, you know, if we train our brain, uh, if we train our mind that way, we would be able to maintain at least our necessary memory, the capacity within our potential to survive in this world. You know? But when it happens, it's very hard to restore. It's very difficult. Uh, uh, so there's no any clear answer for that. You know? mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. I can tell you something. Those who have it, there are two things in the world uh -huh. will help you. The two things will help you. Uh -huh. The tree. The tree, you know, the tree. Okay. And the sun. Yeah. It gave your life. It gave your life. Mm -hmm. The sun yes. gave you your life. Okay. And the tree. Gave yeah. into your yeah. body. Mm -hmm. Right into your body. Into the stroke. He gave up. And go your body and into the sun. He helped you with life. In this world, there are only three few things in the world people don't understand. Mm -hmm. The sea, the sea and the salt. Mm -hmm. Okay? Land. Mm -hmm. Okay? The world is non, non stop on right this world. Goes and come. Goes for it. Just in your body. Move and come back. In your body, in your body, you need to have water. Water is 70% and give the blood. Okay? You go strong all the way into the sun. The sun help you how the cold is the sun. Mm -hmm. You don't need the sun. The tree is the one. You cut all the trees, it happens to the world, break all the things from the Right. And all the animals will <coughs> die and angry because of that. Yeah. And these are the ones you will tell the people. You must have a tree to get on your life. Everything right. goes by itself, break by itself, everything goes, the body also goes out by itself. Yeah, we need to appreciate that. You know, I really love that point. This is something unique that we need to be aware of that we cannot survive alone. We are supported by all these conditions in the nature, even with relationships. This is what we see. Uh, we cannot survive alone. All these things give the life, sustain our life on earth, right? We need to appreciate that too. We need to be aware of that. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, during meditation, uh, you come to a state of kind of uh, calmness and very cool. Do we just continue in that state mm -hmm. and then just enjoy it? Mm -hmm. Or we just have to kind of give up and try to, you know, that's it. Uh, continue with it, and then uh, let's say if we disappear, can we? Should we go back again to that stage, or we just leave it alone and then go on? Mm. Thank you. Right. Okay. Thank you for that question. I think uh, it's very relevant to all meditators, all of us. So, during our meditation practice, we experience many different things, right? Many different conditions in our body many different conditions, experiences in our mind, our consciousness, you know. So that is one. We feel so calm, so soothing, so light, right? It's a very basic, very common experience anyone can uh, see, anyone can feel, experience during the meditation. And as you said, it is not the ultimate goal of meditation. Mm -hmm. It is not the ultimate goal of meditation. Therefore, we should not get hauled on to that. We should not 
get attached to it. We should not stop right there. What we simply have to do is just observe it, just notice that this is what it is. And do your techniques, you know, continue your meditation object, focusing on the object. And that way we cultivate our necessary uh, spiritual faculties. Okay? Right. So I think it's uh, time for us to relax for a couple of minutes to share our positive feelings, thoughts that we cultivated here. So please uh, make yourself very comfortable and relaxed. Understanding your sitting posture. <laughs> gently closed eyes. Taking a few deep inhalations and exhalations. Some long, mindful, gentle breaths. Releasing any tension and negative energies from your body. Feel the presence of yourself. Appreciating this very moment, your spiritual practice, your Dhamma practice. Feel the love in the center of your heart towards yourself. Feel the unique sense of connectedness with your body and mind. Feel the deep stillness in your body with the mind and allow yourself to be here and now in the present moment without any effort, just letting it be, letting it be. Let the body breathe in, let the body breathe out. Feeling the love in the center of your heart. Feel the joy within. All these positive states of being. And let all these positive thoughts, feelings, go to all living beings in the world, in the universe, including all of us who are here now, all living beings in the water, in the air, on the earth, all human beings, all non-human beings. Let your love go to all living beings in all directions without any difference. Broadening your heart, broadening your mind, Feel the sense of connectedness with all living beings, wishing them. May all living beings be well, happy, peaceful and relaxed. May all living beings be well, happy, peaceful and relaxed. Simply understanding the meaning of these gentle, loving, compassionate words. Feel and experience the quality of love within yourself. 
within your body and mind towards all living beings. <coughs> May all living beings be well, happy, <coughs> peaceful and relaxed. Refreshing your body and mind. Thank you very much.